Tonight in Daniel chapter 2, we're going to talk about this amazing dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had. This is one of the most important chapters in the Bible regarding prophecy. Now, I say one of the most because it's interesting. The themes of this chapter are repeated in a later chapter in the book of Daniel, but from a different perspective entirely. And a chapter like this does something extremely important, something extremely important for your Christian life. It should give you more confidence in God and his word. If you listen carefully both to what I say, to what the Bible says, to what the Holy Spirit says to your heart, you're going to leave here tonight with more confidence in God's word and in his ability to speak to your life than what you came in with. So Nebuch- uh, excuse me, Daniel chapter 1, Nebuchadnezzar chapter 1, that's silly. Daniel chapter 1, uh, beginning, uh, Daniel chapter 2, excuse me, beginning at verse 1. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Now Nebuchadnezzar is the king, or if you will, the emperor of the mighty Babylonian empire, the empire that conquered Jerusalem, that took Daniel and his companions from their home in Jerusalem and took them by force as exiles and put them in the University of Babylon, uh, training civil servants, the, the MBA program of Babylon, and training him in that whole system. And we saw last week how Daniel and his companions, at least three of them with him, the, the vast majority of the Jewish young men who were taken away captive to Babylon, didn't care about what they ate, but Daniel and his three companions did. And we saw how God blessed Daniel and the courageous stand that he took in the midst all, of all of that. In any regard, this great king, Nebuchadnezzar, has a dream. And, and if you say, see it right there, the, the dream troubled him. Have you ever had that experience? I, I'm not like that. When I have dreams, I, I almost never remember them. I'll wake up with just sort of a fleeting memory of a dream, and then it leaves me almost immediately. I guess I sleep very soundly, and just the the dreams don't hang around. My wife, on the other hand, sometimes she has very entertaining dreams, and she'll wake up and tell me about her entertaining dream. Now, Nebuchadnezzar's dream wasn't entertaining. It was troubling. So troubling, well, that he couldn't sleep. And I've never had this happen to me. Maybe you've had it happen to you. You've had a dream that was so disturbing, so troubling, that you couldn't go back to sleep. Well, that was the case for Nebuchadnezzar. Now look as it continues here in verse 2. Then the king gave the command to call the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. Now, I know I'm going to read a little bit into the text here, but if I was making a film of this... I would write the screenplay so where Nebuchadnezzar does this in the middle of the night. You know, maybe his dream happens at one o'clock in the morning and he's so troubled, you know, he wakes up in a cold sweat. He's panicked because he had this dream and it's very disturbing to him. And then he can't sleep. It's two o'clock and he can't sleep. It's three o'clock and he can't sleep. And he's a king. He's a mighty king, an absolute dictator of a man. And they're not people accustomed to waiting for anything. And so he says, well, I need to talk to my wise men. I need to talk to my circle of counselors about this. Bring them in now. Well, it's three o'clock in the morning. I don't care. Bring them in now. So they all wander into the king's presence, you know, and they're all sleepy. eyed. They've all been woken up. And so they came and they stood before the king. Now, verse three, and the king said to them, I've had a dream and my spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will give you the interpretation. Now, I need just sort of a textual note here. Beginning now at verse 4 of Daniel chapter 2, all the way through the end of chapter 7, it's not written in Hebrew. It's written in Aramaic, which was the uh, official court language, the government language of the Babylonian kingdom. Interesting, this is the only section in the Old Testament that's written in Aramaic. The rest of it is written in the Hebrew language. So just sort of an interesting note for you. It begins now to be written in Aramaic. So in any regard, the, 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 the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic saying, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we'll give you the interpretation. This is probably something they're very familiar with. King has a dream, important person has a dream. Tell us the dream, okay, we'll make an interpretation. I don't know if you've ever been in this dream interpretation business. 
Uh, there's even a, uh, a column in the Los Angeles Times where people write letters to somebody and say, this was my dream, and, and they're supposed to tell them what the dream is about or what it represents. And, and you know as well as I that people are, you know, it's six of one, half dozen of the other. I could tell you that your dream meant one thing, another person could tell you your dream meant nothing, and who knows, who cares? It, it's just guesswork. So, so the, the, the counselors aren't worried because who can prove them wrong? You just say, well, this is what your dream means, king. It means you're a great guy and everybody loves you. Go back to bed. Oh, okay, great. Well, the, the king isn't going to let him off the, the hook that easily. Verse 5, but the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, and great honor. Therefore, tell me the dream and its interpretation. Well, the the Chaldeans, the wise men, the astrologers, they looked at him and they blinked. Mr. Nebuchadnezzar, you're crazy. You, You don't understand how this works. You tell us the dream, and we tell you the interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar was a smart man, though. He knows that any fool could dream up any interpretation about the dream. But if you really had a message from God, you could tell him what the dream was, and then its interpretation. Nebuchadnezzar knows that the guy who can tell him what the dream was could also give him the real interpretation of the dream instead of just some folder roll cooked up by a creative imagination. Therefore, Nebuchadnezzar comes and he says, you must tell me what the dream is. Now, he was not expecting something that was out of these guys' league, supposedly. These men had come to their position, the the Chaldeans, which was a class of wise men in the Babylonian kingdom, the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers. These were all men who pretended to be in contact with supernatural knowledge. That was on their business card. Chaldean... Uh, in touch with the world beyond. And they'd lay it down. Well, Nebuchadnezzar says, put up or shut up. You've got supernatural knowledge, let's see it. Very wise man, but then again, he's also a very brutal man. When Nebuchadnezzar made threats as cutting them in pieces, it was no idle threat, and they knew it. These guys knew that Nebuchadnezzar was the kind of guy who could do this. As we discussed last week, Nebuchadnezzar was the kind of man who, this is what he did to one of the kings of Judah. He uh, got the king's sons in front of the king, and then he murdered the king's sons right before the king's eyes, and then as soon as he murdered them, he went up to the king, or actually he had one of his men do it, I'm sure, and he gouged out the eyes of the Judean king. Therefore, the last thing that that king saw, the last memory that he saw for the rest of his day was his own sons being murdered before his eyes. That's the kind of guy Nebuchadnezzar was. So they know he could make good on it. Uh, Verse 7. They answered again and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will give its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there's only one decree for you. For you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore, tell me the dream and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. Tough customer, this Nebuchadnezzar. But you see that he's entirely rational. He's thought this through, this thing through logically, and he's confronting the, the soothsayers, the Chaldeans, the sorcerers with his logic. Verse 10. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Now, let me ask you this Is that true or not true? Well, yes and no. Because the knowledge was not with any man, but there was a man in close contact with God who could receive the knowledge. So in any regard, verse 10, there's not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord, or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any magician, astrologer, or Chaldean. This is an operating procedure, Nebuchadnezzar. You're going outside of the rules. Let me tell you, you're not going to get very far with a man like Nebuchadnezzar telling him you're going outside of the rules. He makes the rules. Verse 11, it's a difficult thing that the king requires, and there's no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Mr. Nebuchadnezzar, your highness, this knowledge sits with the gods alone. And Nebuchadnezzar's thinking in his mind when they says, I thought you guys were in contact with the gods. That's what you say. That's what you pretend to be. 
apparently you're not in contact with the gods. And then if you notice what they say at the end of verse 11, they talk about the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. You know, as far as these pagan magicians and astrologers and wise men knew, this was true. They did not know what we know so plainly in Jesus Christ, that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. You almost wonder if there's not an ache, a longing in the voice of these wise men when they say, you know, the gods are out there and they're distant. They don't speak to us. Nebuchadnezzar hears these words from the wise men, them telling the gods don't talk to us. They don't dwell with man. But praise God, he does dwell with man. That he did come in flesh. That he came as a human being and walked among us, adding humanity to his deity, Jesus Christ, Fully God and fully man, Emmanuel, God with us. Matter of fact, the legends say, and please understand, I'm only speaking on legend, but I, I regard it as fairly reliable legend, that Daniel took this, this order of wise men and Chaldeans later on in his career in the kingdom of Babylon. And, and he transformed it, and, and he established certain things, and, and sort of reformed the order of this. And made them godly men. And many, many years later, the, the descendants of the men, or at least the ones who carried their office, were the wise men who came and sought Jesus in Bethlehem. And they saw that God does indeed dwell with man in the flesh. In any regard, we're here to verse 12 now. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious. And gave a command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise men. And they sought to kill Daniel and his companions to kill them. Wow. You ever see the cartoon, the Disney classic uh, Alice in Wonderland? And what does the Queen of Hearts say uh, when she gets angry at something? Off with their heads. That was Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, you guys don't know? Fine. You're dead. Start, start killing them. Well, who, the wise men here in your room here tonight at, at 4 o'clock in the morning? No, all of them. These guys are useless. I don't need them. They, they, they can't do what I need them to do anymore. Just off with their heads. L let's get some new wise men, but just these, these ones are gone. I'm done with these. And so they start executing them. If you notice there in verse uh, 13, it says they began killing the wise men. Nebuchadnezzar was not, you know, he wasn't one of these guys who makes a threat just to get his way. No, you're dead. So they start killing some of them, and, and Daniel's companion, they get a knock at the university door. Or maybe he's graduated by this point. We don't know for certain. He's either at the end of his time or, or whatever. But there's a knock at the, Daniel's door. We'll get up at 6 o'clock in the morning. And, you know, already 50 of the wise men have been killed. And, well, uh, Daniel, come with us. Uh, the, the king's killing all the wise men. <laughs> well, Daniel, what do we do? Well, you, you'll find out here. Verse 14, then, with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. This is his executioner. He speaks to his executioner with counsel and wisdom. No panic. No, no fear. Counsel and wisdom. You know, this is, this is when your relationship with God is really proven, isn't it? It's in the crucible. When the executioner comes to the door, says, it's time to chop off your head now. You know, we're, we're going to, and, and you don't panic. You say, well, God, God's in charge of this, and we'll see if God doesn't have a way out of this. If not, one way or the other, my life is with God either here or, or, or not. doesn't matter. Verse 15, he answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree from the king so urgent? You know, he looks at his sundial and goes, six o'clock in the morning. Well, why, you know, why now? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time that he might tell the king the interpretation. Now that's boldness, my friends. It's boldness for a couple reasons. First of all, just to at, you saw that Nebuchadnezzar was not a man to be trifled with. So just to go in and request this was bold. But then to say, well, give me time because I can bring you the interpretation. Now, you might say, well, who cares? He's dead one way or the other. Oh, no, you don't understand. Nebuchadnezzar was the kind of guy trained in torture. And Daniel well knew that if he said, give me time and I'll come up with the interpretation. If he didn't come up with an interpretation, not only would he die, but they'd probably torture him to death in the most 
agonizing way conceivable. So he's really putting it on the line here. Verse 17, Then Daniel went into his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Isn't that amazing? See, Daniel was in the kind of situation where he knew that only God could meet his need. Only God. Daniel knew what these other wise men did. It wasn't within the power of any man. And you weren't going to go into Nebuchadnezzar's presence and just start guessing at what the dream was. Uh, You know, like the psychics do. A tall, dark stranger in your future, you know, and uh, something important will happen. You know, all these vague kind of things. Nebuchadnezzar was way too smart for that. And so Daniel knew that, that he needed to get a revelation from God, and he knew that that came by prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, the whole battle of the chapter is won right there in verses 17 and 18. The battle was won when Daniel prayed with his friends. I think one of the greatest privileges any man or any woman on this earth can have is praying friends. And history was made in this prayer meeting. History was revealed from this prayer meeting. These men got together and prayed that God would do an unprecedented miracle. They didn't have any place to turn to in the Bible from pages before to to see a place where God revealed a dream to somebody. Well, sure, God gave miraculous interpretations of dreams. They could gather that from the life of Joseph. But, But Joseph didn't have to say what the dreams were. He just interpreted them. And they say, well, listen, we'll pray, and we're going to pray uh, with, with earnestness and, and with passion. They, they prayed that they might not perish. And when we get some of that heart, some of that passion into our prayers, uh, I think God answers in a glorious way. You know, passion and, and heart in prayer is a funny thing. I think cold prayers are an abomination to God. Prayers from a cold heart, from a dead mind that are just sort of spun out or cast out to heaven, you know, and just done by rote, done, done by routine. I don't think those please God at all. But I think that God is also offended by what we might call emotionalism in prayer. Not emotion, but emotionalism. As if God was Baal. You know how they thought Baal worked? Remember that? Elijah and the prophets out in Mount Carmel? What did the prophets of Baal do when they wanted to get Baal's attention? They started running and jumping and screaming and yelling up to heaven and cutting themselves, mutilating themselves. Well, because they had to get Baal's attention. Elijah just laughed. He said, you know, scream a little louder. Maybe your God's gone to the bathroom and he can't hear you. Literally, that's what, that's what Elijah said. And you know, the way some people pray, you, you think they must be praying to Baal instead of God. Because it, it, it's like, well, is God deaf? You know, do you have to flag God down? So friends, I, I have to say that there's, a, that there's a middle road in there. There's a middle road between coldness of heart and emotionalism. There's a middle road that knows how to show godly passion and emotion in prayer. I love the passage in the book of Acts where it talks about earnest prayer being made for the disciples. And the earnest prayer that was made, the Greek word there literally means stretched outedness. And it has the idea, have you ever reached for something, you know, on a top shelf or something like that? And you just have to stretch with everything that you can. Every fiber of your being has to stretch out to grab something. And that's the idea behind that Greek word. It's stretching out to heaven with everything that you have. God honors that kind of prayer, prayer that we might not perish. Now, I would say, by and large, as I look at us, I, I don't think we're, we're in, in much danger of our prayers being too emotional. I, I think we need to pray that God would breathe into us heart and passion in prayer. Because God forbid if, if our attitude in prayer is almost, well, God, you know, I, I don't really care much about it. Can you, can you care about it for me? You know, we need to have our heart beating in sync with the heart of God. And they prayed, they prayed that they might not perish. Verse 19, 
Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Isn't that great? Now, do you know what a night vision is? If you do, tell me, because I don't really know. Uh, some people think a night vision could be a dream. Well, that's possible. Maybe it's a vision that he had that just happened at night. I, I don't think we exactly know what a night vision is, but we know that, that it's something that came supernaturally to Daniel to reveal to him both the dream and the interpretation. And so Daniel is going to praise God here in verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings and gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what's in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers, You have given me wisdom and might and now have made known to me what we asked of you for you have made known to us the king's demand. Isn't that glorious? You know, I love how Daniel exalts the Lord as being higher than any king because he was in the presence of a a terrifying king. Sometimes I I, I wonder about that when I find myself uh, nervous around prominent people. I, I don't mix socially or, or, you know, professionally with prominent people very often. But, but sometimes when I do, you know, I find myself nervous about it. And when that's the case, sometimes I almost get angry with myself. What are you thinking? First of all, they're just a man or just a woman, just like you. And secondly, there's a God in heaven who's so much greater than them. How come I don't tremble that way in the presence of the Lord? If there's anybody I should tremble before, it's God in that manner. And so you think about it, you say, God, and Daniel recognizes, he goes, well, God removes kings and raises up kings. If Nebuchadnezzar's the king, God could remove him if he wanted to. God could raise him up if he wanted to. It's all in God's hands. God's in control of this. I love the, the, the verbs he uses in verses 20 and 21, 22 and 23. He says he changes, he removes, he knows. Daniel knows that the power and might of God and how God is a mightier, well, mightier than a mighty king like Nebuchadnezzar. But then he also says, and this is glorious, in verses 21 and 22, he says he gives and he reveals. You know, friends, all of God's might All of God's wisdom, all of God's power would be meaningless to us unless he gave to us and revealed to us. There's a very famous title of a book that a great Christian man named Francis Schaeffer wrote many years ago. And it sort of expresses this idea. The title of the book was, He is there, you know, God is there, and he is not silent. And really, to have a correct understanding of God, you've got to believe both things. Not just that he's there, but he's not silent. That he communicates to us. Daniel is grateful that God has revealed his great knowledge. And you know what's amazing about it? Did you notice what he says here at the end of verse 23? For you've made known to us the king's demand. First of all, he says to us. Well, I thought he just made it known to Daniel. Look at it. You almost say, if you want to get picky, well, there's a contradiction in the text there, isn't it? Look at verse 19. The secret was revealed to Daniel. Look at verse 23. You have made known to us. Well, who was it revealed to? Just Daniel or all four of them? And the answer is yes. Because Daniel knows that it was revealed to all of them because of their prayer. They all sought God for the answer. And God was bringing deliverance to them all. They all had a share in this because of their prayer. I'm absolutely stupefied by this. Daniel, you can see him rejoicing here, right? At the end of verse 23. How does he know? How does he know? He hasn't run it by Nebuchadnezzar yet. He knows before even running it by Nebuchadnezzar that it's right. Oh, God, this is it. Well, aren't you going to check with Nebuchadnezzar first that it really is the right one, just in case, you know, you had the right dream? Maybe God showed you Nebuchadnezzar's dream from a week ago, not last night. No, no, this is it. Daniel knows. You see, even before confirming it with Nebuchadnezzar, he knows I think that our level of faith is often indicated by how long it takes us to start praising God in a situation. You know, if we won't praise him 
until the answer is in hand. Shows we don't have very much faith, right? But if you can praise God when you have his word on it, even before you have the answer in hand, but you have his word on it, it shows you trust God a lot, doesn't it? Well, I'll take your word for it, Lord. God, I believe, God, that you're not lying to me. Boy, that makes you a giant of faith, doesn't it? To say, God, you're not a liar, God. You you promised it, and it's true. And when you can praise God just at his word, instead of of waiting until you have it in your hand, that's faith. That's where Daniel was. What What a godly, wonderful man. Verse 24, therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon, his executioner. Again, if I write in the screenplay for this, he'd be wearing one of those classic executioner hoods, you know, and speaking from one of that. He wouldn't, of course, but it just, it's a nice picture visually. Verse 24, he went and said thus to him, do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king and I will tell the king the interpretation. Okay, kid, whatever. It's no skin off my nose. You know, if you let me do it now, I'll kill you quick. If I take him for the king and you blow it, I'll kill you slow. Either way, you know, it, it we'll settle this. Verse 25, then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king. But Arioch saw something in Daniel. Look at it here. And said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. Now that's gutsy of Arioch. He really believed in Daniel, didn't he? I don't know what it was about Daniel's manner, about why should Arioch trust Daniel so much? But he's putting his neck on the line. You you know, you could just see Nebuchadnezzar saying, sorry, Daniel, that's not the dream. And Arioch, you brought this man to me? Off with your head. But whatever it was about Daniel, I don't know. But doesn't it show us that, that, that real trust in God is contagious? It is. Daniel had faith. I don't know how. I can't explain it. But it rubbed off on Arioch. Maybe he was telling Arioch what it was on the way walking to the king's place. I don't know. But but whatever it was, Arioch was convinced. So much so that he introduced it, taking some of the credit for himself. I found him. Yeah, Arioch, you found him. Sure. But yeah, Nebuchadnezzar, I searched high and low for a man who could interpret your dream. And here he is. Verse 26. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able... To make known to me the dream which I have seen in its interpretation. I would be scared to death, wouldn't you? Nebuchadnezzar, are you really able to do this, boy? You you can step up to the plate and come through here. Verse 27, Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. That's such beautiful boldness. Verse 29, as for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while you were on your bed about what would come to pass after this. He who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, who make known the interpretation of the king, that you may know the thoughts of your heart. This is amazing. Daniel's saying, look, I don't know this because I'm smarter than anybody. And God didn't reveal it to me really for my sake. Nebuchadnezzar, God wants you to know this. I think this is wonderful. Amazing. Do you know what it is to be an others-centered person? An others-centered person doesn't live their life thinking it's all about them. Everything's about them. Everything that happens around them, their only consideration, how does it affect me? I want you to see that if anybody had a right to be self-centered in this, it's Daniel. His neck is on the chopping block. His body is destined for the torturer's rack unless he comes through here. But Daniel says, Nebuchadnezzar, this is for your benefit that God gave you this dream and the interpretation. God cares about you. You'd hardly blame Daniel for feeling sympathetic towards Nebuchadnezzar. But this is what he says, that you may know the thoughts of your heart. God wants you to know this, Nebuchadnezzar. So here it is, verse 31. 
You, O king, were watching, and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut without hands, which struck the image on the feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces." Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. That's your dream. That's not something you pick up from Miss Cleo on the psychic hotline. You know, this isn't one of those vague dreams. How much more specific can you get? Talk about putting your neck on the line. What if Nebuchadnezzar said, no, you know, the middle one wasn't silver, it was wood, off with your head. But he's right in every detail because God has revealed it to him. And you get the picture here. Here's an image, and it's an image of a man. And the head is made of gold, and the trunk and the arms is made of silver, and the, 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 the belly and the thighs are made of, uh, of, of uh, silver excuse me, of, uh, of bronze. And then the fourth one the, uh, describes the legs made of iron. And then finally you have the feet made of iron mixed with clay. And then here's this great image standing in a spectacular way. It's an impressive image. It's, a, it's an image that really conjures up strength and power. But then a rock comes out of nowhere. It's like a meteor, a comet coming. But it says it's cut, but not without hands. You look at the rock and it's shaped, it's molded in some way. But you look, and just for some reason in the dream, you instantly know that no hands molded this. But that this rock comes like a missile or like a, a mortar from heaven. And it comes and it crushes the feet of the statue. And when the feet of the statue are crushed, the whole thing crumbles down and it just becomes dust. And it blows away like chaff. And then that rock grows and grows and grows and it becomes a mountain that fills the whole earth. And that's the dream that Nebuchadnezzar saw. Okay, great. What does it mean? Here we go. Verse 36. This is the dream. Now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And whatever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he's given them into your hands, and he's made you ruler over them all, You are this head of gold. That's got to make Nebuchadnezzar feel pretty good. You're the head of gold. See that? That that head of gold. That's the best. It's where the brain is. It's where all the critical faculties are. It's where the vision is. You know, the most, you might say, the most important part of your body is the head. And that, it's gold. That's the best metal of them all. You, Nebuchadnezzar, you're the head of gold. Okay, well, what about next? Verse 39, but after you shall rise another kingdom inferior to yours then another a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule all over the earth and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters all things and like iron that crushes that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron The kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. So, Nebuchadnezzar, You're the head of gold. But then there's another kingdom after you. A kingdom will succeed your kingdom. And that kingdom is typified by the the, the chest and the arms of silver. And then there's another kingdom, a third kingdom. The the, the belly and and the thighs of brass. And then there's a fourth kingdom, the legs of iron. So, oh, well, Nebuchadnezzar sees it now. The different materials and the different parts of the body represent different kingdoms. We would probably call them empires. You know, you and I think of kingdoms, and we might think of, you know, a little tiny kingdom nestled away in some corner of Europe, you know, with a little uh, Snow White castle or uh, Sleeping Beauty or Cinderella, whatever, whichever one of those had a castle. And, and, and you know, and they're all there. And, no, th- this is an empire. That's what we would call it in our own modern vocabulary. It says there's going to be empires succeeding yours. 
and they're going to be characterized by these metals. Now, there's a couple things that you say about the progression of metals. First of all, that the metals become uh, less valuable as you work your way down the body, right? Gold, silver, bronze, iron. Now, the kingdoms that they represent are very clear. Friends, I, I tell you, in, in history, in biblical understanding, there's a lot of things that scholars like to debate about. There's really no debate about these. Because succeeding the Babylonian kingdom was a kingdom that was a confederation of the Medes and the Persians. That was the chest of silver. Then there was a third kingdom that succeeded them. The kingdom of Alexander the Great. The great Macedonian or Grecian kingdom of Alexander the Great. Which, by the way, covered more territory than any of these kingdoms. And that's why it says in verse 39, a kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth. He highlights the breadth of its rule. And then there's a fourth kingdom, the kingdom of Rome, which succeeded the kingdom of Alexander the Great. Now, we see that there's a diminishing of value as you work your way down the, the image. And the point of the diminishing in value is not to speak of the size of the kingdoms, nor the strength of the kingdoms. Because a matter of fact, uh, the uh, kingdom of Alexander and the kingdom of Rome were larger in size, and you might say mightier than the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. Then why is Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom represented by gold and the other ones of diminishing materials, diminishing in value? Well, for this simple reason. Nebuchadnezzar was an absolute monarch. He held power in a way that these other emperors did not. Now, in the Medes and the Persians. Did they have a mighty emperor? Yes. But he ruled with the noblemen. You see, in the Babylonian idea, the king was absolutely unique. The king was a child of the gods, and the other people weren't. That's not the way the Medes and the Persians saw it. There was a whole group of royal people, of noble people, and the king was one of them. Then you have the Grecian kingdom. And again, Greece is set forth by brass because it had uh, an even larger set of uh, aristocracy. And then the fourth one, you have Rome, which was really a democratic imperialism. You see, the centralization, the, the raw power of government diminished down the image. But this is what you have to realize about each one of these kingdoms. Even though the value of the materials decreased as you went down the image, the strength of the materials increased. What's stronger, silver or gold? What's stronger, bronze or silver? What's stronger, iron or bronze? You see, and as each one of the kingdoms go, they are less centralized in authority, but they are mightier as kingdoms. And indeed, they were, both in their strength, in their power, in their influence. So we find this uh, absolutely vividly and explicitly fulfilled in history. And might we remind ourselves that this was written while, while the city of Rome was still just a little village uh, on a river there in, in what's modern-day Italy. I mean, this is God seeing the course of human history before it ever happens. And you know why God can say this? Not because he's Nostradamus, and not because he's Gene Dixon and make, you know, some predictions are right, some predictions are false, all of it's jive. No, God can do it because he controls history. He's in charge of it. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. Verse 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountains without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Now, friends, this brings us to a huge dividing line in biblical understanding. There are some people who will tell you that verses 44 and 45 have been fulfilled. And that when Jesus Christ brought the gospel to the world and the apostles preached it in the days of the Roman Empire, 
that it shattered the Roman Empire and it became something that grew. And now the kingdom of God rules the earth and dominates the earth or will one day. I don't believe that's the accurate understanding of this at all. First of all, history provides no fulfillment of this ten federation of kings. Yes, it's true that the empire of Rome oftentimes ruled with a federation of different kings. But you'll never find this, this idea of ten kings or, or the ten uh, collection there together. Never. We also see that the kingdom of God has not functioned in this way. It hasn't filled the earth and dominated it. Nor, nor should we hope it would in the way that some people do. Friends, I don't, I don't trust the church to run the institutions of this world. I, I don't trust the, the, the church to run the government and to run you know, Wall Street, if you will, and to run all the rest of it. You know, th- there was a time when the church was the absolute ruling institution of all culture and society. There was a time when, when the church determined who would be the political leaders. The, the church determined what wars would be fought. When the church determined what would be done economically in the whole culture, there was a time. Most historians call it the dark ages of Europe. See, the, the, the church isn't suit. We're not, re, we're not godly enough or responsible enough to handle that kind of political power. The church should concern itself with being the church. Now, what I think is amazing is that since the fall of the Roman Empire, There's never been a world-dominating empire equal to Rome. Many have tried. You had the Huns. You had Islam. You had the so-called Holy Roman Empire. You had Napoleon. You had Hitler. You had Stalin. But none of them had succeeded. Yes, they had amazing power and influence, but nothing compared to that of the Roman Empire. And, and, And the Bible tells us that the Roman Empire, in some form or another, will be revived under the leadership of the final fallen dictator of this earth, the Antichrist. In the days of that final political kingdom, which which is distinct, if you'll notice in this image. There's the legs of iron, but then the feet of iron mixed with clay. It it, it comes from the legs, but it's not exactly the same as the legs. And in the days of that final kingdom, there will come a missile from heaven, a stone cut without hands. And by the way, might we say that Jesus Christ is that stone cut without hands? The church, isn't it? Psalm 118, Isaiah chapter 8, Isaiah 28, Zechariah 3, all refer to the Messiah as a stone. And it describes a single decisive event. This isn't talking about the gradual Christianization of the earth. This talks about the destruction of the kingdoms of this world. And them coming into submission to the rulership of Jesus Christ. And friends, the, the, the church or the gospel have not and will not, in a single decisive event, shatter the reign of human kingdoms. But Jesus Christ will redo it when, when he returns in glory and power to this earth. It's going to be a smashing, a smashing of the rule of the authority of man. Therefore, because of all this, we understand that the final superpower of the world is going to be a revival of the Roman Empire. Now, friends, you, you might think I'm making a little bit, uh, uh, making a whole lot out of a little bit right here in Daniel. And I could understand your point. But, but in my mind and in saying things we don't have time to go into tonight, we're drawing from a whole other set of passages of Scripture that speak along the same lines, that run along in the same currents uh, from the book of Daniel that we'll see later on together. In this final world empire will be the one that the returning Jesus will conquer over. It's interesting that that Daniel tells us that this final world empire will be partly strong and partly fragile. This iron mixed with clay. You know, iron doesn't really mix with clay, does it? you got a mixture there, and it sticks together, but it doesn't stick together. And it's partly strong and partly weak. And, and, and it'll have more the image of true strength rather than the substance of strength. And I, I, I think that that's... That's going to be so true of the Antichrist kingdom. You know, when you look at that image, this image that represents human rule, the the, the kingdoms of man as it stands there, Nebuchadnezzar, it seems so impressive, so glorious. What a mighty image. That's great. But look at the foundation of it. At the very base of it, it was unstable. And one blow to the foundation of it makes the whole image crumble. Friends, I... I want you to know one other thing before we we move on. 
that some 40 years from this, Daniel had a vision describing the same succession of empires. Do you understand that? 40 years after this, God gave Daniel a vision of these same empires. Daniel saw it from God's perspective. Now, when Nebuchadnezzar saw these human empires, this kingdom of man, he saw it from man's perspective. And how did it look? As an impressive image of might and power and strength. You know what Daniel saw these successful, these succession of empires as? Ravenous beasts. That's how God looked at them. Well, Daniel concludes here, verse 45, and the dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. Daniel wasn't guessing. He wasn't thinking. This was God announcing the future. Let me ask you a question before we look at verse 46. Does God know the future about big things? Or big things and little things? Is it, is it, just, is it just the big things that he thinks? You know, God, you know God's the, you know, just give him the big picture and all the details. Well, you know, that's up for the people to work out. I don't know, a commission of angels or something. Now, what did Jesus say about God and the little things? Now, Jesus said things to us that if anybody else said them to us, we'd say, you're crazy. God sees every sparrow that falls to the ground. Honestly, if I told you that and Jesus didn't, you come on. You, you're using preacher's license there. God knows the number of hairs on your head? You, you'd only believe that from the mouth of Jesus. Yes, God has the big picture in control, but he has the little picture of your life. You know, just as much as God has not left human history to wander aimlessly anywhere it might go, but God has a plan and a direction and a destination for it. In the same way, he's got a plan for your life. Your life. A destiny, a purpose, and and you might be kicking against it with everything that you have. But you know, his plan, his purpose, his destiny for your life is so good. You know, you... You tremble or you fear or you withdraw from that plan because you doubt his love for you. You think that maybe he's brought that plan into your life, you know, just because he's the kind of God who is looking around and seeing if anybody's having fun and then he wants to stop them. And so, you know, his plan for your life pretty much involves taking away all your fun. What a misunderstanding about the heart and nature of God. Verse 46, then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face, prostrate before Daniel, and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him. The king answered Daniel and said, truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the the king of kings, a revealer of secrets, since you could not reveal this secret. You wonder if Daniel said, so I was right? You know, I guess so. I guess that's it, huh? No, Daniel didn't have to say that because he knew it. He knew it as sure as anything. Verse 48, Then the king promoted Daniel and gave him many great gifts, and he made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and the chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon, those that were left anyway. Um, Also, Daniel petitioned the king, and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. You know, when you think about how mighty and powerful and arrogant this king of Nebuchadnezzar was, for him to fall on his face before Daniel like this shows how deeply he was struck. You know, Neb- I'm sure that, that the courtiers around, you know, in the royal court there were dumbfounded when Nebuchadnezzar did that. I mean, they're saying, Nebuchadnezzar, couldn't he have just said, right? You know, I mean, but no, he falls on his face. And he says to Daniel, your God is the God of gods. It's it's your God who's revealed these things to you. And because Daniel wanted the glory to go to God, it it did. You know, God, God wants to be glorified in our life. He wants your life to bring him glory. And he's given you gifts, he's given you talents, he's given you abilities, he's given you ways you can serve him. Do you have a passion to see God glorified through those things? Or do you want to take some of the glory for yourself? 
how easy it would have been for Daniel to take some of the glory for himself here. It's amazing that he's able to resist it. You know, God is jealous about his glory. And it's not because God's an egomaniac. You know, people around us who want all the glory, we really don't like them, don't, do we? They're very annoying to be around, very frustrating. It's like they want all the credit. They want all the glory. And you think, well, is God like that? No, not at all. Do, do you want to know why God wants all the glory? Because it's just the right thing. He deserves it. It's not because he's an egomaniac or, or the most insecure being in the entire universe. It's because he, he deserves it. And when the creature gives glory to the creator, things are positioned right. It's just right. It fits right. Daniel was careful to give glory to God. But, you know, God made sure that Daniel was promoted. Because it says there that Daniel was promoted by the king and he didn't only have his life spared. That would have been enough. But he was promoted to high office and he made sure that his friends were also promoted. And isn't that appropriate that his friends shared in the advancement because they shared in the victory, didn't they? Through what? Through their prayers. Friends, we just marvel at the, at the great power that God gives to the believer in prayer. Now, I think that one of the mightiest things that any human being can have is influence, right? Isn't that what a lot of people want with money? It's not like they want the money for itself, like, you know, Scrooge McDuck in the Disney cartoons where he has his is a vault filled with money. He likes to go in there and just lay in it, you know. Oh, money, money, money. What do most people want money for? They want influence. And money can buy you a lot of influence. Well, why do people want, want fame? Influence. You think, who, who are the most influential people in the world today? I mean, well, you know the president, George Bush. Now, that's an influential man. You think of titans of business like Microsoft's Bill Gates. Oh, man, there's an influential man. This isn't just preacher talk, folks. People of prayer are the most influential people on this earth. Do you understand that God has put it in front of you to be more influential than the mightiest men and women on this earth because through prayer you can move the hand of God? I don't care how many billions Bill Gates has. I don't care how many uh, nuclear warheads and, and bombers that the President of the United States has at his command. The hand of God is mightier than any of those things. And through prayer, you can move the hand of God. Daniel's friends did it, revealed to us the future. It reminds us that God has a glorious plan for our life. Let's, uh, let's thank him for it right now. 